Tonight, we showcase the accomplishments of this year's stormwater quality section as we explore and share with you how the city manages this vital resource. But first, I would like to recognize and thank the leadership of our organization, for without their vision and active support, none of the programs you're about to see tonight would have been possible. We express our deepest appreciation to the Salem City Council, our Mayor Chuck Bennett, our City Manager Steve Powers, our Public Works Director Peter Fernandez, our Operations Manager Mark Bechtel, and Nitin Joshi, our Environmental and Regulatory Affairs Manager. Thank you all for laying the groundwork which empowers staff to actively and effectively engage in the work we do to serve our community. The Urban Stream Symposium began three years ago with the vision of Public Works staff providing the public with an update of the stream crew internships accomplishments over the season. Since last year's symposium, there have been a slew of media reports on natural disasters locally, nationally, and worldwide. My extended family and friends on the Big Island of Hawaii experienced the active eruption of Kilauea Volcano, which damaged nearly 700 homes and forever changed the landscape. It was followed up by Tropical Storm Lane, which dumped almost three feet of rain in 48 hours and flooded my hometown of Hilo. Today, Hurricane Florence's death toll rises to 32 as floodwaters linger in North Carolina. Communities across the globe are facing real threats from our changing environment, and Salem is no exception. This past summer, our very own community faced the threat of cyanotoxins produced by harmful algal blooms in Detroit Lake. Clean drinking water, the most essential resource upon which our individual health and overall community well-being depends, was threatened. Public Works mobilized, adapted to the situation, and responded in force to protect public health. We have learned and continue to learn from this experience, which strengthens our ability to respond and recover from crisis and adversity. It is resiliency upon which our community depends, and it is a grit found amongst our Public Works employees that push our community toward resiliency. Managing stormwater in Salem is no different. Year upon year, we collect high quality data, translate that data into meaningful information, take that information and turn it into action, and adapt as our, ac and adapt as our actions turn into accomplishments. The purpose of this symposium is to share with you just that, all the data, information, action, and accomplishments of our section, and to have an open dialogue for how best to manage this dynamic resource we call stormwater. The stormwater quality section of Public Works has multiple functions, and each of the speakers tonight will demonstrate the value it brings to our community. We begin with Anita Panko, who is the newest member of the Public Works management team, overseeing a technical section responsible for a variety of monitoring requirements in her new role as environmental monitoring supervisor. She begins her talk tonight explaining just what stormwater really is and the federal and state permit requirements associated with managing this ubiquitous resource. Her talk explains why we conduct water quality monitoring throughout our water bodies and pipe infrastructure and how the data is used to establish pollutant budgets for threatened streams. Justin Boynton then takes the stage to talk with us about how the city manages a quantity of water falling on and flowing through our city. His presentation explores the amount of precipitation that fall as rain and snow in the Mill Creek watershed far outside the city limits and how our rivers and streams respond to these storm events within the city. He discusses the tools the city uses to collect real-time data and the models developed to assist in forecasting both rainfall and stream levels. Following Justin is Gray Wolf, who is a natural areas and Green Stormwater Infrastructure Program Coordinator. Gray and their team of four full-time and two seasonal staff manages the city's 200 acres of natural areas and mitigation sites. And with the help of the stream crew and operations maintenance crews, 90 miles of creek and hundreds of individual stormwater quality facilities citywide. Gray brings to the team a balanced approach to stormwater management, combining knowledge of natural ecosystem services and applying it to the built environment. It is in our natural areas and green infrastructure program that we take action to manage stormwater as it flows through the urban landscape and into the Willamette River for downstream populations of humans and wildlife. And bringing us home tonight with her presentation on this year's stream crew is Meredith Greer, who will be taking the stage for the last time as Public Works intern. 
Meredith has served on the stream crew for the past four seasons, each year moving up and taking on more responsibility. This past May, she successfully completed her bachelor's degree in environmental science from Willamette University and will begin work as a water resources educator for the city of Tumwater, Washington, starting next month. Meredith's presentation will take you into the world of stream crew and explain how, over time, the stream crew's function has grown to become not only a pillar of protection for our community, but a complementary collegiate resource in helping the Public Works Operations Department address our community's shared challenges. I am delighted and excited for all of you to meet and learn from our stormwater staff, and I hope you enjoy tonight's presentation. Welcome and enjoy. Good evening, my name is Anita Panko, and as Keith mentioned, I am the Environmental Monitoring Supervisor for the Stormwater Services section. My work group conducts both the surface water and stormwater monitoring within the city of, city of Salem limits, and we also implement the flood warning system. I want to start off tonight to talk about why do we care about stormwater. Living in an urban environment as we do, the majority of the city's surfaces are impervious. So when the rain falls, instead of absorbing into the ground as it would in, an in a natural environment, it runs across the hard surfaces and picks up pollutants and carries them into the nearest stream. Our job in stormwater is to try to capture the stormwater, slow it down, and provide treatment, while also educating the public and encouraging behaviors to reduce pollutants, and then lastly, conducting monitoring for compliance. This graphic illustrates some of the pollutants that are common in an urban environment. As you can see, many of our daily activities, including the maintenance of our homes and vehicles, are potential sources of pollutants. Even during the dry months, the things that we do have an impact on stormwater, as those pollutants can gather in the asphalt and the concrete, and then when the rain comes, those pollutants are picked up and carried into the nearest stream, which can cause an even greater load of pollutants. The Clean Water Act was created to address water quality pollution from various sources, including municipal sources such as wastewater treatment plants. The Water Quality Act of 1987 expanded the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System permits to also cover stormwater discharges with special municipal separate storm sewer system permits for cities that have uh, their stormwater and sewer separate. One of the requirements of this MPDS MS4 permit is to create a stormwater management plan. The stormwater management plan outlines best management practices and measurable goals required to protect water quality. Salem's stormwater management plan has 66 best management practices, which range from structural things like installing rain gardens and water quality treatment facilities to treat stormwater, and then also non-structural programs such as education outreach and street sweeping. When BMPs are put into practice, they can benefit our environment by providing protection of wetlands and aquatic ecosystems, improved water quality of streams, reduction in stream erosion, protection of public health, and flood prevention and control. Oops. Sorry, I can't go back, but the slide that I just went over was to meet all of our permit and stormwater monitoring requirements Stormwater services are broken into two work groups, operations and maintenance, as well as water quality. Our operations and maintenance section repairs stormwater infrastructure, cleans and mows roadway, roadside ditches to improve conveyance and capacity, and assists with maintenance of mechanical water quality facilities, which we'll learn a little bit about later. Then there's our stormwater quality work group, which consists of three functional work groups of full-time staff who are dedicated to stormwater monitoring, education outreach, and then natural areas and green storm infrastructure. We also have a seasonal stream crew, which is made up of interns from college. And all of these different work groups help with the permitting and reporting requirements of our uh, permit. I would now want to move on to what my work group does for monitoring. And you'll hear the term monitoring a lot tonight, and it can mean a lot of things. It's a broad term referring to the tracking of an activity's progress by gathering and analyzing data. But when I talk about monitoring, what I'm referring to is the physical collection of stormwater and surface water to meet our seven environmental monitoring requirements for our MS4 permit. These can be further broken into in-stream monitoring and stormwater monitoring. 
The in-stream monitoring consists of monitoring the streams and collecting samples, and the storm monitor monitoring is the collection of samples during rain events and mostly consists of the piped system. Now I'm going to breeze through our monitoring requirements fairly quickly, uh, but afterwards there will be posters outside the stream crew has put together and they'll cover a lot of the water quality parameters that I'm talking about, as well as we'll have staff on hand to answer any questions you might have. We have a network of 10 continuous in-stream monitoring stations within Salem city limits, and these record data for stage height, pH, connectivity, temperature, dissolved oxygen, and turbidity. The data is recorded every 15 minutes, and the stations are running 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There are two stations on each of the five streams that we monitor, and these are located in upstream, downstream fashion so that we can have an idea of the water quality as it enters and exits the city. Besides just collecting the data, the data loggers at each station are also programmed to consistently scan the data looking for specific criteria and thresholds. When a criteria is breached, the data logger then sends an alarm to our city's 24-hour dispatch center, and they contact the environmental services staff who is on um, call for that day. And so these can, calls can come in regardless of time of day, and someone will respond. And so the environmental services staff will review the data using the same interface that is shown up here, and if it looks like a potential discharge, like the pH that I've circled, uh, they will then go out to that station and begin looking upstream for the source. Common sources of alarms for illicit discharges can be anything from people draining their swimming pools, washing cars with soap, and things like oil, dirt, chemicals going down the catch basins. While our environmental services staff have the authority to write citations, we first try to use this as an opportunity to educate the public uh, about things that they can't do and try to give them ideas of things that they could do instead. Next, we have our monthly in-stream monitoring program, which started in 2001, and it involves the collections of samples once a month at 24 different sites. Samples are analyzed for pH, connectivity, temperature, dissolved oxygen, turbidity and bacteria, as well as nutrients, BOD, metals, and suspended sediment. These stations, just like the continuous in-stream monitoring stations, or these sites are chosen to be upstream, downstream, and so we can see the quality as it enters and exits the city. The city also does macroinvertebrate sampling on Pringle Creek, East Fork, Pringle Creek, and Clark Creek. These locations were chosen so that we can replicate data sampling that was done in 2000 and 2001. Within our five-year permit term, sampling is done twice, and it includes the collection of um, bugs from the stream that we send off for identification a fish count, as well as physical habitat information such as slope of bank, stream bed material, and shade. Macroinvertebrate sampling, when paired with water quality data, can really give us a good idea of the overall health of a stream based on its characteristics and what species are choosing to live in that stream. Moving on to stormwater sampling. Uh, like I said earlier, this involves sampling during selected storm events both within the pipe system, and then we also have one monitoring element where we do it within the, the actual stream itself during rain events. Storms are chosen uh, specifically for ones that look like they'll produce enough rainfall to collect samples over a, a duration of the storm event. And then those samples, once they're collected, are sent off to our lab to be analyzed for total and dissolved metals, suspended solid, or suspended sediment, bacteria, nutrients, as well as we also collect special samples for pesticides and mercuries that get sent off to labs that can analyze them. So you're probably beginning to wonder, where, <laughs> where does all the data go? What do we use it for? So looking at the big picture, the intent of all of the stormwater quality monitoring we do is to determine if water quality standards that have been set to protect both human health and aquatic life are being met. In order to do this, we submit all the data that we collect to the Department of Environmental Quality, and then they create a list of water bodies they believe to be impaired for specific parameters, and then those are sent off to the EPA for approval. Once a water body has been deemed water quality limited and put on this list, uh, also called the 303D list, a total maximum daily load, or TMDL plan, is created. The TMDL plan specifies the maximum amount of the pollutant that the water body can receive to still meet water quality standards. And so then permittees can create best management practices to meet that TMDL 
and then continue to monitor for compliance. And so the cycle then starts over. By setting these limits, the goal is that the impaired water body will eventually meet the water quality standard. A good example of this for Salem, um, as I mentioned just a moment ago, we collect low level mercury and methyl mercury, mercury data. And we have now submitted that data to DEQ as well as other permittees here in Oregon. And so the DEQ is using that data right now to create a TMDL for mercury for the Willamette River. After collecting all of this data, the city also summarizes and analyzes these data points to help characterize stormwater based on land use types, geography, season, evaluate the effectiveness of best management practices, evaluate long-term trends and the effect of stormwater on receiving water bodies, and then assess progress towards meeting our pollutant reduction benchmarks for our TMDLs. We also use the data to adaptively manage our programs and determine what is effective and what isn't. We can also cater treatment to certain parts of town that have more of a problem than others and determine what types of treatment are working. Now aside from just meeting our minimum monitoring requirements, we also try to utilize our specialized monitoring equipment that we have and the knowledge of our staff to assist other departments and projects as we can. For example, we are currently assisting with bacteria sampling ahead of a triathlon that's happening this coming weekend and we are conducting baseline water quality monitoring in both Oxbow and Willamette Sloughs for an invasive aquatic weed that is in the left there. And then now my colleague Justin is going to talk about another way that we have gone above and beyond utilizing our network of continuous monitoring stations to monitor for water quantity and the robust flood warning system that we have developed. Thanks for the introduction, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, my name is uh, Justin Boynton, uh, flow monitoring analyst for the city of Salem. And uh, I'm gonna be talking about the one of Salem's newest uh, monitoring programs, or really one of our newer programs that we have here at the city of Salem, and that is our flood warning system. Is that not loud enough? Or? Okay. And uh, so in order to do that, I really need to kind of go take us back to the 2012 flood event. And a uh, big part of my presentation is going to be kind of talking about where we were in 2012 and where we are today. So basically, we had the 2012 flood event. We caused uh, quite a bit of damage across the city. Numerous areas were inundated. And um, you know we lost access, north access to Salem Hospital. The state motor pool lost over uh, 100 vehicles in their uh, state motor pool parking lot. It's a very damaging event. Um, so what exactly happened during the event and uh, why it is that we need a flood warning system? So in order to uh, prove my point for why it is we need a flood warning system, I put this chart together here. And what this shows is the actual rain that fell during the 2012 flood event versus what the National Weather Service happened to be predicting during that same event. And you can see there's this wide disparity between the two. And uh, so, you know, the bottom line was, is when, as we went into that particular event, we kept looking at the forecast and thinking to ourselves, gosh, it sure has rained a lot more than what we thought it was going to rain, but it's supposed to stop and it's supposed to stall. In particular, looking at this uh, bar right here, where we have about two inches of rain that fell during this 12-hour period from 9 p.m. to 9 a.m., from the 18th to the 19th, where the forecast was essentially calling for a half inch of rain during that same time period. And what that meant was is that we were very much kind of caught in the dark, if you will, because our flood event happened in the middle of the night. This is a hydrograph of that same event for one of our gauging stations that's located at North Salem High School. And what this is showing is that, you know, basically at 3 a.m., just so happened to correspond, I know, with the time I showed on the chart before, but that our, uh, the height of the stream actually surpassed flood stage on this particular creek. And that was really the point in time that we realized that we were in an event. And the people that, you know, were really working at that time, of course, were emergency responders, police, and fire. And uh, consequently, you know, when public, or when I came to work that day, I didn't know it was going to be flooding, and I ended up driving through flood water in order to get to work. 
Um, of course, what we want to see is that we have that flood threat recognition line get pulled out well to the left of where the uh, flood stage actually gets surpassed. Not only that, but we also want to be able to estimate what our peak flow is expected to be. In a flood warning system, those are the ultimate goals. So as far as the design of the flood warning system, we knew that we wanted to improve data collection. We needed to increase our network of stream and rain gauges. We wanted to develop a way to produce predictions, especially for the Mill Creek watershed, so that we can under, get a better understanding of uh, both the peak and the surpassing of uh, the uh, overtopping of flood stage. Create a uh, data dissemination website where all of this data would be housed in one, um, one single location and develop a partnership with the flood warning system. Um, that's another thing that happened during the 2012 event. Because everything happened at night, you know, the city of Turner, you know, their flood, they knew that they were in a flood event right around dark the day before. Where we went to bed, we didn't know that we were in that flood event. You know, we wanted to make sure we established that line of communication so that we could at the very least get a call from our upstream neighbors saying, hey, you'll never guess what's coming down on its way. So some examples of some uh, gauge um, gauging stations. On the uh, left, we have uh, a stream gauging station that's located on Mill Creek right as it enters the city of Salem. Uh, this particular gauging station also houses water quality information or houses water quality sensors that Anita talked about earlier. And the picture on the right is of a uh, standpipe rain gauge that we have up in the watershed. Now, it might look like this rain gauge is out in the middle of nowhere, and that's because it is. And that's exactly where we want it, because we were trying to monitor basically well outside the city of Lincoln what's happening up in the watershed itself. So taking a little bit deeper look into what we had back in 2012, um, at the time of the flood event, uh, we had 11 stream gauges at that time, and we had uh, zero real-time rain gauges. Now, that's kind of the number that we really want to focus on here. While we did have a pretty good stream gauge network, we were pretty lacking in the rain gauge department. But as of today, moving forward six years, we've got a total of uh, 14 different uh, stream gauges today within the city limits, as well as seven uh, real-time rain gauges. In addition to that, we have two more stream gauges that will be installed for this upcoming flood season one of which will be on Clark Creek at Gilmore Field, and the other one will be on Wall Creek at Wiltsey Drive. For the Mill Creek watershed itself, which is what's been uh, shaded here in purple, the, uh, the example of where we were to where we are today is a little bit more uh, stark. So during the 2012 flood event, we essentially had four stream gauging stations, and you can see this vast area up here where we really didn't have any monitoring equipment. Fast forward to 2018, you can see that our network has really expanded substantially. We now have eight stream gauges within the watershed as well as 13 real-time rain gauges. What this allows us to do is not rely so much on the National Weather Service now for what's happening. We get a first-hand look at the system stalling out over our area, which is what you know essentially Florence has done, why they received three feet of water. And it's essentially what happened in 2012 as well and why the predictions were so far off from the National Weather Service. We're now able to see that view via this data. In addition to that, we also incorporated a number of ambient air temperature sensors that are located throughout the watershed. And the reason for that is, is we, need, we know that we need to identify where the snow level is. And we've mapped out through uh, GIS and different mapping protocols the different flood or the different elevations of topography throughout the watershed and strategically place these ambient air temperature sensors so that when we start seeing snow fall at lower elevations that we have a better sense of where that snow level is and then also we can then calculate through different algorithms that we've developed what the snow water equivalency would be throughout the watershed. So all of this data then is housed in the uh, mid Willamette Valley High Water Watch website and we prove we provide all of the stream gauge data and rain gauge data in a variety of different templates, and whether it's a map view or a tabular view as well. Example of a table view is what's shown here. This is a screen capture that I made yesterday of the current stream levels. And um, where you can see here, you got the last value. It shows you the time that that data has come in. 
And for hypothetical purposes, let's say that we happen to be in an event and we start to see these levels start to surpass these high water watch or flood or major flood levels, then the data and website itself will actually start to turn various colors. And when it starts lighting up like a Christmas tree, it's basically start to time to uh, head to higher ground. But lots of information can be gleaned just from that itself. In addition to that, I mentioned that we do have some mapping capabilities as well. This is an example of rainfall data that, uh, again, that I collected yesterday. I took a 48-hour sample that showed the rainfall that we got over the weekend. Um, in this particular view, you can select whether you want to see it in seven days, whether you want to see it in the last 15 minutes. It really gives you that first up-close personal view. Excuse me, sorry about that of what the, um, the data has been looking at over a given period of time. In addition to that, we've also created within the website or provided links to all the various uh, different forecasting resources that are available for us as well from the National Weather Service, be it from the Nat Northwest River Forecasting Center or you know different radar, things like that. It's really, we want to create one website where you can see all the information you might possibly need to view both for the public as well as myself, I use this website all winter long to uh, to get a better sense and understanding of what's happening with the rainfall and what its effects might be on our streams. So the website does get quite a few hits. This thing's just kind of dropping on me slowly. Um, the website does get quite a few hits. Um, there's a couple examples. Obviously, we had a, a minor flood event back in 2015 that really put this website on the map. Got some recognition for it in the newspaper at that time. Where we had about 78,000 hits. And then this piece of data here is back from last winter where we had uh, quite a bit of uh, wet weather and consequently quite a bit of activity onto the website itself. In addition to that, we do offer a, uh, or we do offer, we do ha now have a uh, predictive capabilities as well, where we are able to synthesize all the data that gets collected through all of these gauges, put it into a model, and actually produce a forecast as well for the Mill Creek watershed, which also includes some other stations um, along Beaver Creek and as well as Battle Creek as well. So the application of the system, I talked about the website before. We also have uh, data-driven alerts that are built into the software itself. Um, we use the system for the implementation of the city's flood response operations plan, as well as uh, advising on when to send out warnings to the public. So what are data-driven alerts? So data-driven alerts are, uh, you know, they're, they're a tool that we use that essentially is analyzing the data through a, com a computer algorithm that says, you know, okay, I want to send a warning to operation staff when a threshold at a particular gauging station hits a certain level. An example of a type of data-driven alert would be that, you know, that I have here where Pringle Creek Station greater than 7.2 feet, what comes across into the operation staff cell phone is, is you need to go out and set up road closures because we know that road is either about to be flooded or is already flooding at this particular location along Madrona and Airway Drive. Another example would be for cloudburst events, which is particularly important during the fall when we get a lot of leaf fall that falls on the ground, has a tendency to collect uh, stream grates and catch basins. And we uh, use these alerts to dispatch people as soon as that rain hits the ground. So as far as the city's flood response operations plan, um, as I mentioned, the system also, you know, drives that plan. Obviously, I talked about the first responders before. Um, you know, their primary goal is to make conveyance through our system. In addition to that, we uh, utilize environmental monitoring staff to analyze data, run models, inform management of flood threat level, whether it be minor, moderate, or major flood level, as well as um, you know, and, and that flood threat level is what actually drives the actions of not only public works, but the police department, the fire department, as well as emergency management. Um, some examples of that might be for public works department would be that they would take the information from this system that gets synthesized by us, and then they would go out, set up sandbagging stations, get prepared to set up road closures, various other things like that, where police might 
ready themselves to do evacuations, fire department, swift water rescue, emergency management might activate the city's emergency operations center. And as far as the communications to you, the public, of, the, of a flood threat, we, uh, one of the primary avenues that we use for that is the Salem's Community Alert System. And this URL that's right here is where you can go to the city's website, click, get to that URL, and uh, set up your alerts both for your home, your work, or other places of interest, whether it's a child's school or something like that, that might be within a floodplain. And that might be something where you want to get advanced notification or you know, at least know when the city knows that a flood event is imminent so that you, you know, might make the decision to pull your kid out of school or to at least call the school and see what their plan is. Of course, we use other avenues of information as well, whether it be press releases, TV, radio, about a pending flood wave. But by signing up for these particular alerts, you ensure that you're going to get it directly to your phone via either a text message or some sort of voice message. And it's really the most efficient way of getting those particular messages. Some additional added benefits for the flood warning system. Uh, the city uh, participates in the FEMA Community Rating System Program. And what that is, is a program that um, allows the city, uh, you know, basically it's a different uh, regulations and programs that the city em employs here that makes the community more flood resilient. And the more flood resilient you, we are, the more points that we get. And having a flood warning system is, gives us quite a bit of points within the community rating system. And what that means for anybody that lives within the regulatory floodplain is that they get a reduction of their flood insurance. And it currently stands, I believe, at 25% reduction of what that premium would otherwise be. The data also supports future structural flood control options. Right now, the city of Salem is in cooperation with uh, the city of Turner, working on a Mill Creek mitigation study, where we're actually looking well up into the watershed, different mitigation options to where we can keep some of those floodwaters before they actually hit the city of Salem, or, well, before they hit the city of Turner. But So we even get more benefit from that. But um, in addition to that, we're currently doing the stormwater master planning effort and of course, uh, as we collect this data into the future, we'll get a much better understanding of the long-term impacts of climate change. And with that, I'll go ahead and hand the mic over to Gray Wolf that will be talking about essentially the bridge of what you see out in the field on the, a daily commute or a daily drive and the, from uh, the bridge between water quantity and water quality for what you might see out in the field. All right, thank you. Hi everybody, my name is Gray Wolf. Uh, I'm the, the uh, Natural Areas Program Coordinator for the city. Um, and what I'm gonna talk to you about today is exactly what Justin just kind of uh, introduced you to. Uh, you heard Anita Panko talk about monitoring for water quality, and you heard Justin talk about uh, assessing water quantity in, in the flood risk management program. Um, my program is set up to manage those natural areas and man-made structures that actually treat uh, storm water before it enters our streams uh, further down. And uh, so like I say up here, our team manages natural areas and green infrastructure facilities that clean and retain polluted storm water. So basically uh, what's on the ground, the infrastructure, whether it's natural or man-made. So I'm going to start first with the natural areas wing of our program. And uh, I want to just kind of start off by saying why we do what we do. I think it's important just to, to understand why we're even around. Um, and so uh, one of the big things is we want to increase awareness of the importance of natural areas and green spaces. We want to, obviously, when we go into these ecosystems, we want to restore and enhance them. Um, so a lot of, a lot of natural areas and urban environments have seen a lot of degradation. And so we go into areas, as I will discuss later, and we enhance the biodiversity, the flora, the fauna. Uh, we take inventories, et cetera to see what's out there. A big part of what you're gonna be hearing tonight is, you know, how is the city building resiliency in the face of things like climate change? And we are out there every day figuring out 
you know, what natural areas need to continue to be on the landscape to uh, affect that resiliency, to keep the resiliency in place. Um, so we are effectively trying to say we need to save some of these natural areas to account for uh, climate change and flooding, et cetera, into the future. We also, you know, and this just touches on when we restore and enhance ecosystems, we're really affecting biodiversity and we're increasing that dramatically. We obviously need to balance the human component in anything that we do. Uh, we want to make sure that our form follows our function. So when we are out on the landscape restoring these ecosystems, we want to make sure that people can access the beauty of nature. Uh, so we are in, in the ecosystems creating trails, educational signage, uh, and really building up an opportunity for you to see your natural areas. Uh, a big part of what we do is we educate the public. Uh, when we're out on site, we are constantly handing out information. We're, stop, we're, we're open to questions continuously. And we do partner a lot with our education and outreach wing uh, to, to get information out to the public on natural areas and management. And, you know, just this kind of goes to the theme of the entire night, but we are trying to uh, kind of protect our bottom dollar, and that is, you know, water treatment and storage on, in an urban landscape. So how much, how much do we manage effectively? How many natural areas do we have? Well, we have roughly uh, 200, 200 acres that we actively manage uh, this year. Now, that total does increase every year, um, and so we are adding acreage. If you check in with us next year, we'll probably be up 50 to 100 acres. Okay. Where are our natural areas? And it's important to, to know this because I think a lot of folks may confuse natural areas, what exactly a natural area is, and I, I'm putting this up here to show you that uh, in fact, you have natural areas right outside your back door, uh, truly. You could drive for a couple of minutes, probably um, two to five minutes, and find a natural area in the urban landscape. So they're everywhere. What type of natural areas do we manage? Right now, we are taking on streams and riparian corridors. We are managing oak savannas, and I'll get into each of these habitat types later. We are managing wetlands, and we have active mitigation projects dotted across the landscape. So I'm going to start with riparian corridors, you know, and, and forgive me if some of this is a little bit of review for some of you, but um, it's important to kind of just define what a riparian corridor is, and that kind of tells you why we're managing it. Uh, riparian corridors are the connection between streams and upland areas, so it's really the effective floodplain of a system. And the reason why we manage, and I'm going to point down here, yep, this is Gibson Creek Natural Area. This is in West Salem. The reason why we manage these areas uh, is because, obviously, um, it's kind of a falsehood to think that natural areas are that way. Uh, they should be left as wilderness. And, and honestly, all wilderness has been affected at some point by the hands of humans. And so what we do, we go in and we do invasive species management to kind of tend it like an organic farmer. We don't go in heavy handed with herbicides or pesticides. We really try uh, to have a light footprint on the environment. So in this picture, the top picture is, uh, some of you in this room are familiar with this area. Uh, this is a bunch of ivy, kind of an I ivy um, conglomeration up in the top picture. And then, you know, after the pool, um, what that system can actually look like when it's removed. Another big area that we have is in South Salem. So this, if you're familiar with Walden Drive, uh, this is a, a mitigation project, a stream mitigation. Uh, and basically, this was planted due to impacts elsewhere in the city. This stream was constructed, reconstructed, and planted uh, roughly eight years ago at this point. And so this is the amount of vegetation that has grown. This was not naturally occurring in eight years. Uh, and we are now at the point where this is a fully functional ecosystem and beavers are moving back into the landscape, and so it's wonderful to see. Um, you know, a lot of folks have a, some hesitancy when it comes to beavers on the landscape. Uh, as long as the beavers are not causing extensive flooding, et cetera, to homes uh, in, the, in, you know, in the surrounding areas, we tend to leave them there. We do actively monitor all of the beaver dams that we locate, so we do make sure that they are not providing any kind of flooding uh, risk to the, uh, the public. So the other type of natural area that we manage, as I alluded to before, is mitigation. And mitigation really is, is simply put, it's restoring, enhancing, and preserving streams and wetlands in response to impacts to those natural resources somewhere else. 
Um, and this is all, uh, all required by uh, agencies, Department of State lands, Army Corps of Engineers, and DEQ are the major players there. They require compensatory mitigation for, for surface water impacts. And uh, when you think about mitigation, what you're trying to replace is unavoidable impacts. That's the key phrase there. So some impacts when you're doing development are avoidable to wetlands and streams and some just aren't. And a good example of this is back in 2014, we were realigning the intersection of Madrona and 25th. Um, and let me go forward. You have the East Fork of Pringle Creek here. This was before the realignment. Okay. In 2016, this was in the, the heart of our construction and realignment. And so as you see, the stream had to, to be changed. It had to kind of change course a little bit here. Um, we're going to move forward. And then in 2018 is when we finished construction. And you see we've replanted that East Fork of Pringle Creek. Um, and the next slide. I'll kind of show you what it looked like right after we planted it. A contractor came in, did a wonderful job. Uh, reestablishing the vegetation along the stream. They put in some large woody debris here to slow down the water. So this was in 2016 when it was planted. And in just one year, this is what it looks like. Okay, so this, this goes to show you that, um, you know, mitigation is not always a be-all, end-all, but it does work uh, at, from time to time. It's not a one-stop shop, but there are, there are some definite benefits to replacing uh, resources as you impact them. <laughs> so, one year. Okay, so everybody knows Back to the Future, right? Okay. Um, I barely do. So, so wetlands are the other uh, major uh, habitat type that we do manage, and, and in fact, we spend a majority of our time managing, actively managing wetlands. And the reason why we do that is, some, is what I'm going to point out next. Uh, wetlands are truly the link between water and land. And they are just special, special natural areas in and of themselves. In order for wetlands to be on the landscape, you need three different parameters. You need a special kind of soil, which is called hydric soil. You need water to be present uh, for a particular period of time on the landscape. And you need special plants called hydrophytes. If you don't have those things, then you do not have a wetland. So there are, I'm going to give you some of the, the predominant types of wetlands in the Willamette Valley, and specifically in Salem. There are forested wetlands. You probably have seen these. Marsh-type wetlands and vernal pools. And if you're not familiar with vernal pools, vernal pools are just a special kind of wetland that really is only inundated in, with water in the fall, winter, and early spring. And by the, the late spring, they dry up completely. It would almost be like if you didn't know what to look for, that they were never there. Uh, but in fact, in this picture, the vegetation speaks loudly, that even though the water is not there, you have a certain assemblage of vegetation that's growing in that shallow. Okay. So I wanted to introduce you to some of Salem's wetlands that we manage. This is, um, so maybe if you're out trolling about, driving around, or you want to take a hike, you can, you can look at these. Um, this is the West Fork of Pringle Creek. It's a floodplain wetland right at Fairview Industrial Avenue. This is Fairview Mitigation Wetland right across from ODF&W building uh, along Fairview Industrial Drive. Uh, this is a mitigation wetland, so it's kind of incredible to see, but this is almost 20 years old. And uh, it was not actually on the landscape previously. It was put in place and, and constructed due to impacts in that industrial zone along Fairview. And uh, it's just turned into just kind of a wonderful mecca for flora and fauna. This is Garen Island. Uh, this is the North Pond. It was uh, it, roughly, I believe, 20 years ago, a mitigation site for Oregon chub. And since then, we have been in there actively managing aquatic invasive species in this pond. This is Battle Creek Natural Area. We've been partnering with our parks section to really go in and manage uh, the wetlands in this area. This particular area was actually a golf course at one time, and it has since reverted back to wetlands. This is Minto Brown Island Park. So these wetlands are just right out your back door. If you kind of uh, walk the trails at Minto at any time, you'll see this, this beautiful uh, wetland here. 
And I wanted to bring this wetland in only because I wanted to point out to you that a lot of our natural areas that we manage are these large 50 plus acre areas, but we do manage small pockets uh, of natural uh, areas. And Edwards, Edwards Drive is an example of that. This is a three acre wetland in South Salem, right along Edwards Drive Southeast. And we're in there managing it actively. It used to be mitigation, it's been turned over to us and we are going in and clearing invasive species in there. So I told you that we really focus on wetlands and the reason why we do is because of, in fact they are rare. Uh, less than half of Western Oregon's wetlands remain on the landscape and this was kind of an older number. There's probably less than that now. Wetlands are really the habitat type that protects water quality. They bind up pollutants in the vegetation, in the soil, in the water. Uh, they slow floodwaters and uh, they, they lock up pollution. They help to re reduce the severity of flooding. So the more wetlands we keep on the landscape, the more nature can do uh, the attenuation for us, the, the, the saving the floodwaters for us. And if you're warm and fuzzy and you care about animals like I do, um, they are nurseries for just tons of animals. They are biodiversity hotspots. There are areas where the greatest proportion of flora and fauna exist in North America. And I'm, I'm going to show you some slides. And these are all animals that I, I got to hold in my hand and I took pictures of. So these are all from our natural areas that just are outside your back door. Does anybody know what this is? It's a salamander egg case, and it was in a tiny little log. This is kind of a crazy looking thing. This is a macroinvertebrate, soon to be a caddis fly. But this is the, the, the juvenile version, and this guy is in here, but he spins his own case, and he hides in it and protects himself out of sticks. Any ideas what this might be? Exactly. Praying mantis egg case. Beautiful snake. Uh, the long-toed salamander. Tree frogs. Uh, one side note, one great side note about these guys is in our natural area, Fairview Wetland actually, we had thousands of baby tree frogs this year uh, hatching and hopping all over the place. So it was wonderful to see. Okay, so wetlands and other natural areas are important, obviously, like I, I kind of alluded to, for the recreational component. We, want, we don't want to fix the site up and then just say, no, no trespassing, sorry, you're out of luck, you can't see this beautiful resource. We want to be able to bring people closer to their natural resources, and that's why I have this slide here. And just know that when we're out there, we are thinking continuously of ways that we can have you all come and enjoy these areas just as much as we do. So what are we doing in these natural areas? I keep saying we're managing, we're managing. Um, we are doing habitat assessments and wildlife surveys. We are monitoring invasive species and doing removals. We are maintaining trail systems. We're building partnerships with other sections and agencies continuously. Uh, we're doing outreach and education and special projects. This is an example of kind of a special project, uh, like I said in the slide before. This is Fairview Industrial Wetland. The same section of Fairview Industrial um, is in each one of these pictures. This is what you call adaptive management. It's basically responding to changing environments with new management strategies. When I came to the city in 2016, the Fairview Wetland at the summertime looked like this. So it looked like a cracked, dry, vacant area. And so that got me thinking, what if we just, in 2017, dammed up the outlet to that wetland and, and saw how much the water might back up? So we did that. And lo and behold, in the summer of 2018, this is the same area. Okay, All of the native vegetation is rushed back in. And so this year, and basically this month, we've actually installed a water control structure in the area where we had the sandbag dams to permanently control the water throughout that wetland and kind of mimic a natural uh, hydrologic regime for that wetland. 
So we are actually also doing integrated pest management and it's a big fancy word and all it really means is using your head to think about the best strategy to deal with a pest um, and it really depends on what pest you're talking about. So what we do is we run down the list of manual or mechanical, biological, cultural and chemical responses. We figure out which is the most appropriate for the pest that we're dealing with, okay? So we don't run straight to herbicide. Um, and you'll see here in these pictures that we employ all kinds of IPM strategies. We will burn invasive species if we think that they will respond to it. We do manual removal. And this is an example, you're probably familiar with this, of biological con control using the cinnabar moth to eat tansy ragwort. So I've been talking to you about basically, you know, wetlands and natural areas that are dotted kind of on the periphery, sometimes scattered within the urban environment, but as we move towards the city center, uh, green spaces really start petering out. You'll start noticing more impervious surface, more blacktop, more asphalt. And this goes to show you kind of, this depiction is what the Willamette Valley looked like um, pre-settlement. So I'm, I'm sorry if it's hard to see, but mostly the Willamette Valley was forested with some oak savanna and prairie habitat. Fast forward to 2010, and we've got Salem here, with this the, indicated by the red circle. That's urban environment, and the purple and the green is forest, and what's left is agriculture. So we've really turned the ecology around in the Willamette Valley. So basically, what, I, what I'm kind of getting at in these last few slides is the number of wetlands and natural areas that are able to naturally filter pollutants have been removed from the landscape over the past 100 years, okay? And they've, done, they've, been, they've been removed by processes such as fragmentation of just dividing them up. And a good example of that is here where you divide a uh, natural forest up by a road and houses, et cetera. They've been removed through degradation of just decreasing their quality over time. And this is a good example here where you've pared down this riparian area on the stream. It's a very thin riparian area. And we've also just straight out destroyed a lot of our natural areas with development. Okay, and a good example of that is here on Hayden Slough where we could have a really big buffer on this slough and allow for pollutants to be removed by vegetation, but really we just have an open canal, okay. So as development increases in impervious area, humans have to be creative. We have to think, okay, how do we develop and then still think, of, think in terms of natural systems? We've removed all of these great natural areas and filters We've got to put some stuff back on the landscape to mimic those, those ecosystems. And so that's really where stormwater treatment facilities come in in the urban environment um, is we start dotting these along the urban uh, landscape to mimic filtering and pollutant removal capacity. At the city of Salem, I'm kind of transitioning into the, the stormwater uh, treatment component of our program. We actively manage roughly 800 mechanical facilities. I'll go over what these, these are. We manage 300 public green storm, stormwater infrastructure facilities, and then we have some hybrid facilities that are a mixture between mechanical and green stormwater infrastructure. And it's important to know the city, we manage all public facilities. We do not manage actively private facilities for obvious reasons. So where are our green stormwater and vegeta vegetated public stormwater uh, facilities? They are just like the natural areas all around the city within the built environment within the urban growth boundary. Mechanical stormwater treatment is kind of an emerging field and uh, we are getting more and more of these facilities every day. And I wanted to show you that they can be a little deceptive as you're driving along the road, um, you know, wherever you may be at the, at the time, there's probably a storm filter of some sort below you in the road, okay? And I'm gonna show you a little bit about how these storm filters work. What do they do? So really essentially, like I said, they're acting as wetlands, even though they aren't. So water flows in from one direction, it comes off the road, flows in, and gets filtered by all of these canisters that have filter material in them, okay? And then the water rises in that and then passes on out and flows downstream. So kind of, we, we've got, like I said, 800 of those kinds of mechanical facilities around the city and roughly 300 of the green stormwater infrastructure. 
you're, these green stormwater infrastructure facilities are probably more noticeable to you as you drive down the road. They're actually curbside or they're at interchanges, et cetera. You'll be able to see in just a moment. But a lot of these facilities, are they're, they're called swales, rain gardens, basins, filteras, planters. These are all probably things that you have heard at one point or the other. These green facilities work by filtering, infiltrating, and capturing stormwater and removing pollutants. And unlike mechanical treatment, as I said, there's a, there's a vegetated component to these. For example, swales and rain gardens. Um, this is along Madrona Avenue, if you've driven that recently. Uh, and this one here is along Edwards. So basically, the way that, that swales and rain gardens work is basically using vegetation to filter pollutants and a, an engineered soil media to also filter and infiltrate water before uh, sending it on down to a stream somewhere. Basins are really just glorified rain gardens, so they're large facilities. These are, th this one here is at the intersection of Madrona and 25th. Uh, this one here is also, and then this is at our new construction waste processing and transfer center. And so really we're just capturing rainwater and we're infiltrating it into the soil and not in kind of locking any of the pollutants up into the soil that might be present. Planters are, are more noticeable if you're, if you're walking on sidewalks because they tend to be right roadside or right next to a sidewalk. And what they do is they flush, uh, you know, water gets flushed off the sidewalk or off the roadway, falls into planters. The roots of the plants that are in this media lock it up, lock the pollutants up, and then the rest is infiltrated down and flushed out. You're seeing kind of a theme here. Uh, filteras are an example of kind of a hybrid facility, so where we have mechanical treatment and green stormwater treatment. Uh, filtera system includes a tree. Uh, water does come in off the roadway, gets filtered out by the roots of the tree, and then goes over into a catch base and settles out and then continues on its journey. So what are we doing? Uh, just like natural areas, we have kind of a regime of things, of manage that, management that we do in these uh, mechanical and green stormwater facilities. And as you see, we're kind of, we're basically like landscapers, right, in the, in the built environment. We are inspecting, pruning vegetation, we're weeding, doing invasive species removal, sediment removal, planting, garbage and leaf collection, repair and monitoring of these facilities, and we have roughly 300. So I'm gonna leave you kind of, you know, I, I'm saying a lot, but I wanna leave you with say, some things that you can do on your own and uh, you can carry forward, and pay it forward, I guess you wanna say. But volunteer, reach out to us. My door is always open or my email is always open. Um, reach out to us and volunteer. We'd love to have your help. You know, this sounds simple, but really, you, it's harder for some people than you think. Uh, just, you know, try, try to clean up after yourself. You know, everybody just try to be a, a good steward of the environment. And I say this because, you know, I'm out in the natural environment and I see uh, how damaging best intentions can be. And so when you're out enjoying nature, uh, make sure that you're res respecting the fact that all the animals there, all of the plants there want to remain there, okay? So enjoy, take a picture, um, and then leave, leave whatever you're, you're enjoying be, okay? And the biggest thing is spread the word. Spread the word that the city is out there on the landscape managing green stormwater and natural areas for you, okay? And, and that's kind of how we get this all started um, and get some support for it. I want to say a big thank you to my team, um, and we've got seven of, seven of us currently, um, and then in a few months, five of us. So think about all of what I've talked to you about today and understand that there are only five of us in the city that are really actively managing those. Um, so we, are, we love what we do. We are tasked to the max, and um, you know, we are, we're fighters, and we, we love what we do. So I wanted to end with some photos of our crew. We truly love what we do, okay? Um, you, it, it, look at the smile on her face. I mean, and she's covered. Uh, so this is uh, Andrea Kent and Ken Albin here. They do, uh, they're kind of the stalwarts. They do a lot of our invasive species management. Um, this is me with, with my crew here, and then we are doing kind of a drain tile reconna reconnaissance at a wetland. This is Kyle Lawrence, and we've got Beth Tanner, Tobin Peterson, and Kyle Anderson here. All right, so we we so we're, we're awesome. We can't do it all, right? You know, nobody can do it all. So I'm going to hand the mic over here in just a second to the stream, the, the lead stream person, uh, Meredith, 
we really rely on them to get down into the streams and monitor and help improve those systems. Okay. And I wanted to leave you with a final thought, and you know, maybe we should have left it for the final, final thought, but you know, at the end of the day, all of our programs that we're talking about today, I want, to, I want you to know that this, this shows you, proves to you that the city is thinking about water quality and quantity issues, and we're really focused on resiliency into the future. Okay. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to Meredith. Hello, as Gray mentioned, my name is Meredith Greer. I'm the environmental aide for the Stream Cleaning Crew. As we heard from Gray, Justin, and Anita, the full-time stormwater staff covers a number of different topics and does a ton of work, but they're not always able to do everything. And that's where the Stream Crew program comes in. So I'm gonna start off with a little bit of information about Stream Crew's history because it, doesn't, it hasn't always looked the way it does today. The Stream Crew came after the 1996 flood. Some of you living in Salem may have remembered the flood. The flood was absolutely horrific, worse than the 2012 flood. Tons of people lost their homes. And so the city of Salem decided, what can we do to try and mitigate flooding in the future? So in 1998, the stream crew program was born, but it looks a lot different than it does today. In 1998, the main purpose of the stream crew was just to clear as much vegetation and natural debris that was in the creek channel, possibly blocking flow, as possible. The goal was to get water through the creeks and out of the city of Salem as fast as possible. And while that's fantastic, there is also the option of trying to focus on the natural environment. So in 2000, the stream crew changed once again to add a restoration project as part of the annual goals for the stream cleaning crew. The restoration project serves as a way for the stream crew to also be enhancing the riparian areas that are found next to a lot of these streams. And in 2003, they took that goal one step further by only hiring college interns who focused on natural environment. By having people working in the streams who have background knowledge in the environment, natural resources, and management, they were able to make smarter decisions to balance the natural and urban nexus that we see in the city of Salem. The Stream Crew Internship now has two main goals for its interns. One is to build work experience. This is done by using in the field, hands-on tools such as chainsaws, but also data collection, they work on plant identification, but there's also the goal to try and increase their understanding of stormwater as a whole. Um, so Stream Crew takes a number of different site visits to various sites. They see where Salem treats its drinking water at Garen Island. They go to Willow Lake where Salem treats its wastewater, as well as a couple of other different stormwater techniques managed throughout Oregon. They also get um, presentations by various other environmental groups such as the Oregon Environmental Council came this season and talked to the stream crew interns about management they're doing in stormwater elsewhere. This year's stream crew had a wide diversity in the number of students and their backgrounds. The fact that we have so many people coming from different backgrounds and from different schoolings allows stream crew interns to learn not only from full-time staff but also from each other. Coming at similar problems from different backgrounds allows stream crew to best utilize the skills that each intern has individually. Now stream, stream crew functions all across Salem. There are roughly 90 miles of streams through Salem. Stream crew walks roughly this many miles in each one of the creeks. This season, the stream crew walked 56.88 miles of creek, which is actually about seven more miles than any stream crew had walked before. Part of this is because the stream crew is trying to actively manage all streams and areas that have the potential for flooding. And this meant getting eyes on every single one of these streams. Now, as I mentioned before, a lot of stream crew's goal is to balance the urban and the natural landscape. The city of Salem is a natural urban environment, and the goal of the stream crew interns is to not only ensure that urban environments are being protected, so flooding is not occurring, we're not having infrastructure damage, but also to acknowledge that riparian areas are extremely important to our environment, to people, to habitats around there. So as stream crew interns are walking through streams, they keep these things in mind throughout it. And by doing this, we're able to accomplish three main things while in the streams. So stream crew interns inspect the streams. This means that they are taking data on natural things, such as bank erosion, invasive plants, things like that. But we're also, as being boots on the grounds, are able to see infrastructure. 
For example, this picture over here is a water pipe that was crossing a stream under a bridge. Nobody would have normally seen it until the problem was much larger. Stream crew noticed it while they were out doing their inspections and were able to alert the water department that one of their lines was broken and was leaking water. By having boots on the ground, stream crew are able to kind of help manage the urban aspect, pipes and infrastructures like that, but also the natural environment. Stream crew also works hard on debris removal. This is a picture of a debris jam on Walnut Creek. It's kind of hard to make out, but back here, there's a, no there's a lot of natural debris. So those are sticks, twigs, things like that, large woody debris, and also a shopping cart. So this is the before the stream crew removed all of that, and this is after. Stream crew's main goal in removing debris is to prevent pollution. So that's one of the reasons that we remove a lot of trash. And the other is to prevent flooding. And so debris jams often back up water, and we can see that once they are removed, water is easily conveyed through those areas. The stream crew also collects the number, a lot of data. Um, stream crew can collect data on water quality, invasive plants, but they also collect data on infrastructure. As we can see here, an intern taking a picture of a retaining wall. The ability to have stream crew in the field collecting data allows the city of Salem to best utilize the interns in the field. Now, data collection has come a long way in the past four years. As Keith mentioned earlier, this is my fourth year on stream crew. And when I was starting out, we went out into the field every single day with a map printed on a piece of paper. If anybody knows anything about streams and paper, they don't get along super well. Data collection was highly inaccurate, and more often than not, we came back with a wet sheet of paper. Over the past four years, the program has changed tremendously, and, not, and a lot of that is thanks to the program coordinator, Pete Dalrymple, who is able to move the stream crew from paper onto our cellular devices by using ArcGIS Online. ArcGIS Online is a tool that allows stream crew to use their mobile cell phones in the field to collect accurate GPS data. Stream crew is able to collect data on a number of different fields here are able to put down data points that are geo, G, GPS located so they are accurate so we can go back into the field and find them again, and are able to collect data on a number of different parameters and attach photos. And as anybody knows, a picture is always worth a thousand words. This also allows me, back in the office, to be able to see in real time the data that the stream crew interns are collecting. Stream crew interns are collecting a number of different parameters, but one of the most important ones is stream miles inspected and walked a number of debris jams here. As we can see here, red sections, both of stream and of these circles, which are debris dams, easily allow the stream crew to track what miles have been cleaned and what hasn't to ensure that all the work is done throughout the season. I'm gonna go through a couple examples of data that stream crew collects and why they're important. The first one is flowing outfalls. Outfalls are pipes that lead from streets onto the streams. In the summer, when the stream crew works, they generally shouldn't be flowing as we haven't had a lot of rainfall. Because they are flowing, that generally is an indication of either infrastructure damage or an illicit discharge, as Anita mentioned earlier, which is um, when a pollutant is being added to the stream system. Stream crew interns are, allowed to, are able to track these sources of water and can work later on to try and identify where they are coming from. Stream crew also collects in, uh, invasive species points. The two main ones we focus on are yellow flag iris and Japanese knotweed. Invasive species are a big issue in our riparian areas as they often crowd out native species and can cause infrastructure damage with their long roots. Stream crew being able to track these and know exactly where they are allows stream crew to go back in and take management techniques or replant in certain areas to increase the, ha the biodiversity and the habitat in our natural areas. Stream crew also collects erosion data. So this is for hydro modification. Um, stream crew has been able to see how the streams are changing in, in Salem throughout a number of different years. Hydro modification data first got taken by a private firm in 2012. And by having the stream crew able to now go out in the field and relocate those points and take pictures of what they look like now, gives the Salem of Salem a better idea of how the streams are changing and how we can best adaptively manage them. The last, oh, oh, the last data point we collected were debris jams. Um, so debris jams, as I mentioned earlier, are when debris is blocking flow. So this is a picture of a grate that we have that was all covered in debris, and the stream crew was able to clear it. The reason that the stream crew 
um, takes data points of debris jams is so that the city of Salem is able to actively manage those sites and can sometimes put those sites on high priority lists so we are able to go back during flood events like Justin had talked about and make sure that these areas are cleared to ensure conveyance. Now we talk a lot about debris jams. The city of Salem and the stream crew specifically also tries to remove that woody debris. We don't want it to be clogging further downstream so the stream crew takes out as much woody debris as they can. This is a graphic showing how many cubic pounds per waste of green waste that the stream crew collected this season. It is important to keep in mind that all of these watersheds are of different sizes, so sometimes the, the amount of woody debris isn't always necessarily an indication that that creek has more problems, but it's good information to keep and track over time. The City of Salem also collects trash as one of its primary duties. This is to ensure that water quality is at its highest and to try and keep our streams as clean and pristine as possible. While that may have seemed like a lot of trash, overall, the streams are actually getting more clean. So when stream crew started in 1998, they were finding so much trash, and now we're not finding as much. And so by not having as much trash to clean up, the stream crew is actually able to increase the scope of its work to other different aspects. One of these aspects the stream crew helps with is dry weather outfall sampling. I mentioned earlier about flowing outfalls and not knowing the source of them. One thing that the stream crew has taken part of with the help of full-time monitoring staff is grabbing samples of these outfalls and testing them. The stream crew often tests for things like chlorine and fluoride, which are indications that a drinking water pipe has had a leak. Once stream crew interns have taken data and collected samples and are able to test that, if they've determined that it's a drinking water leak, they can work with full-time staff members, such as Pete Dalrymple, to do a pipe shed investigation in hopes of finding a large leak. Pete has been pretty successful with this program and found a number of different water mains that have been deteriorating over time that people wouldn't generally have known about if stream crew hadn't been on the ground to see these. Stream crew also deals with illicit discharges. Um, stream crew, as being boots on the ground, are able to see some things going into the creek almost as they happen. This year, stream crew responded to oil on Claggett Creek by working with the Environmental Services Division to place a boom and soak up that oil, as well as finding and working with Environmental Services to stop an active dumping of dirty mop water from a certain high school. Stream crew is doing its best to track down these certain illicit discharges, but could always use your help. You guys are the ones living in and around these streams. If you ever see something that doesn't quite look natural, the City of Salem Public Works Dispatch is 24-7 and will be more than happy to take your information and send out somebody to take care of this as soon as possible. Our natural environment is very important to everybody and ensuring its health is something that we can all do. Now the stream crew in 2018 has done a ton of work. They've inspected almost 57 miles of creek, removed over 2,000 pounds of trash, cleared 57 debris jams which contributed to about 43 cubic yards of natural debris, I need to shout out to the amazing crew who was this season, as they can be seen here. Very excited to be there in their first day in the streams in Claggett Creek. But the stream crew isn't having its first season. The stream crew has actually been going on for 20 seasons now. And over those 20 seasons, they removed over half a million pounds of trash and over 2,000 pounds of natural debris. But not only that, the stream crew has worked on things like macroinvertebrate studies and helped with hydromodification studies and done a number of different bank restoration projects. The stream crew has done a lot in 20 years, and it's only more exciting to see what they can do in the next 20 years. Keith Bondagwin is going to come up and close out this part of the this, of this symposium. Thank you for your time. Well, thank you to all our speakers, Anita Panko. Justin Boyington, Gray Wolf, and Meredith Greer. At this time, I would like to um, present an award. Uh, if I can find my wording. Okay. <laughs> Over the past four years, Meredith has been instrumental in implementing the vision of the stream crew and in the process has provided our community with one of the most unique management practices in the stormwater industry today. A highly motivated workforce with the ability to incorporate new technologies and workflow processes to assist in environmental data collection to inform responsible stormwater management practices for our community. 
The stream crew program that started in the late 90s has matured into an integral component of public works operations. And as you have seen tonight, continues to be a pillar of service and stewardship in our community. On behalf of the City of Salem Public Works Department, I would like to present to you, Meredith, an outstanding service and stewardship award for your four years of service on the stream crew and for the lasting impact you have made upon our community. Aloha and mahalo, and thank you for your service. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. <laughs> Good job. The library is going to kick us out in about 12 minutes. Um, so we're going to, I'm going to ask for all of the um, presenters to um, come up on stage, um, as well as in our uh, breezeway, um, and to uh, interact with our um, our guests. Uh, we have about 15 minutes for you to ask any questions you have of the staff, get their contact information, and um, be in touch. Thank you so much. <laughs>